Um, hey, Bob, thanks for coming on today. Um, Absolutely. I think uh, we'll definitely be covering AI and um, venture investing into AI and all that fun stuff, but I think it'd be prudent for the um, audience if we just went over your early tech career and how you got to the point of being an investor. So maybe you can start at WPI and onward. Um, feel free to go high level or get in depth. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I graduated with a CS degree from Worcester Polytech uh, here in Massachusetts. My first job at a college was a startup, so I've only ever been in the startup uh, tech world. Um, I actually entered college thinking I wanted to build robots, um, so started as an electrical engineer. But then as I was taking my first electrical engineering courses, realized how hard the physical world is, and so decided to shift gears into the virtual space of, of CS and coding, where you can basically play God and just code whatever project that you need to do and not have to worry about the constraints of, of physics and reality. Right. Um, but anyways, that very first um, job out of college was for a company called Art Technology Group. At the very beginning, we kind of did random projects to pay the bills, um, a lot of professional services. And this was in 1994. So this is sort of like pre, you know, web, pre big internet though. As I was graduating college, um, you could start using the NCSA what, uh, Mosaic browser and kind of see what's happening online in kind of the early days of that web. I got connected uh, to the folks at Art Technology Group because of my senior thesis, which was a homebrew VR system um, way back in the day. So I was way too early in terms of market timing. But yeah. my, uh, my teammates and I, we built this um, this little uh, you know system using a um, a Nintendo Power Glove, um, and it had flex sensors in it, and we could hack it into a, a PC using the RS two thirty two port, and there was some open source rendering software we could use. And our underlying thesis, uh, you know, some thirty years ago, was that uh, VR was too inaccessible to the average person, and we needed using today's language, no code tools that allowed people to, um, you know, build v VR worlds. Wow. And, and so we had the system where you could use gestures uh, in the glove to, you know, create objects in a virtual space. Um, and uh, ATG had done a exhibit at the Chicago Museum of Science Industry on VR. Um, they were hired by the museum to basically build a VR exhibit um, back in the day. Yeah. And when I learned about that, um, you know, I sent in my information and, and uh, fortunately got connected and was excited uh, to work with them. And my first experience of what it meant to be at a startup uh, was uh, going in for my interview at ATG. I had you know, gone to interviews at Microsoft and General Electric and, you know, very traditional with full suit and tie, printed out resume, et cetera. Um, I drive into Harvard Square on a February day and meet um, the co-founder and CTO, and he's in a t-shirt and ripped jeans, I you know, probably mid-20s. And um, he said, oh, hey, Bob, it's nice to meet you. I, I wanted you to meet the rest of the team, but they decided to go snowboarding today instead. Um, so that was kind of my first introduction <laughs> to the dynamism <laughs> of, of what startup life would be like. Yeah, and d with, so, okay, so let's halt on the yep. meta stuff. So, or not the meta stuff, but the metaverse, which is now today. When that came about maybe a year, half ago, did you say, wow, this is so familiar? Um, like you were um, so early. That's so early. Yeah, I mean, I, I because of my interest in VR that started, you know, thirty years ago. I've always paid attention to it, but to be honest, I've actually been quite skeptical about, oh. uh, you know, how prevalent it will become. Um, right. I, I understand, like, it can create like an amazing immersive experience for gaming and and maybe some new types of media experiences. Right. But I, I haven't actually been a big believer that it would be pervasive um, in, let's say, the same way that like mobile phones are and the like. Yeah, yeah. I do think that Apple has some pretty interesting ideas that they're exploring and like reframing it around visual computing. I think there's some good mental models and metaphors. Um, right. And so I'm actually more excited, interested, but I still think it's going to take a long time um, yeah, I'm for kinda, these platforms to have a, a big impact. Yeah, because I, I mean, the 
the metaverse revolution that happened with uh, referencing was almost like people were excited about um, creating a world where people will live in and do a lot mm -hmm. of different things. Um, but um, I'm more thinking like the entertainment space is really the thing that I see as yeah. maybe, well, you used to go to the movies when I was little and 3d movies were like the big thing. Now I think maybe that'll evolve into that, but for like, um, real estate for instance in the metaverse actually having a lot of value and all that stuff that didn't really take off and a lot of people were excited about it so i think i'm on your side on that um and i didn't um so you, you didn't make any like investments in the metaverse. no 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 i've never made any vr investments gotcha. metaverse investments nothing right. like that I, I think my skepticism um yeah. uh you know kept me away from that for a long yeah. time but, well, I, but i am but i am intrigued and interested to see what sort of evolves over the next uh, few years mm -hmm. um and i think it, you know the you know these new platforms may be the greatest movie theater that's ever built that you know <laughs> you know just considering the experience that can be done for that but i still think we'd be missing something from a social perspective like i honestly yeah. don't know is my wife and i really going to sit on a couch together and put our own glasses and watch right. the same movie uh, i don't yeah. know right right we say that because we have a standard that we've known, even I do, even though I'm only 29, but the kids that are being born now, maybe that new standard will evolve and they won't even think that the traditional way is the way that they don't want to get interrupted. So who even knows? I mean, yeah. I'm still here, but I don't think it's gonna go crazy where everybody's gonna have one like a phone. But um, yeah, I mean, you could have easily invent, invested in OpenSea or all these metaverse companies mm -hmm. and you didn't, and good thing you didn't because they're all, I think at zero. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so, so the yeah. earliest days of Art Technology Group literally was like a meet, like a the intersection of media and technology. So, yeah. Like right. we we built like um, a movie ticketing system. We we were hired to build a cyber cafe in Harvard Square, um, and okay. just around that time, we started getting hired to build a website. Um, right, <laughs> which was like a novel new form of media creation. Wow. And that led into like a fundamental transformation of the business where we started building tools to build dynamic websites and that get formalized into application servers and, uh, you know, developer frameworks. And eventually that company, ATG, you know, we grew to be over 1,200 employees from the 10 or so when I joined out of college. Um, mm -hmm. And we built some of the very first uh, core software infrastructure for e-commerce mm -hmm. and launched some, you know, amazing brand stores online, including like J. Crew and American Airlines and, you know, tons of others. Mm -hmm. And so that was just a really formative experience for me. Um, yeah. It's my first job out of college, kind of going through that type of growth. Yeah. And being a software architect and kind of, you know, working at the, at that time, the sort of the cutting edge of like, you know, where media and technology was, was leading at that stage. And it also kind of instilled in you right out of college that you can, you can, you, it's possible to create from scratch and go to a legit business yeah. company. Cause obviously 10 people, jeans, t-shirts, snowboarding, like that must've been like, I'm at a, you might, not, I don't want to be harsh, but you might've been like, why this is a mistake. I need a legit company, but you joined and then you went. To yeah. So, 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 the, so anyone that becomes a founder or is an entrepreneur at heart, um, yeah. has a certain amount of naive optimism. Um, yeah. and in some ways it's almost like a religious belief, you know, it's like you believe despite, uh, everything pointing that you're insane. Um, and that was absolutely true for many moments at ATG. So you can point at the success of having hundreds of employees and being a public company and all that. But there was also a period of time and there was like 30 or 40 of us. We ran out of cash. Um, yeah. We didn't get paid for six months. Uh, I don't think anyone left the company, maybe one or two people. Um, I gave my life savings to the company to pay bills. Like it's a totally irrational thing to yeah. do. Well, why did we do that? There was like a fundamental belief of what we could accomplish as a team mm -hmm. and how the web was going to transform society. And it just felt perfectly logical 
to step in that type of morass. Now, I have to empathize because there's lots of people that have an equal conviction and put all the chips on the table and things break the wrong way um, mm -hmm. and everything still fails. Well, that's the majority. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, but but if you don't have that persistence, you know, some people right. call it grit, vision, whatever. Whatever, yeah. Then, then you never play the game. Yeah, you never get to, because anybody can have an idea, anybody can incorporate a company, yep. get to 10 people, but can they withstand the filters of failure and, and scaredness? And I think that's what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, so that was, it was just a deeply profound experience right. for me, um, yeah. the first, first decade of my career. Um, right. And I think that experience set the stage for everything that I've done afterwards. Like, like Breakoff, which is... Yeah, yeah. So when I left ATG finally in um, 2004, so after a decade, I did mm -hmm. I connected with this gentleman, Jeremy Allaire, uh, who um, previously had been the CTO at Macromedia and had worked mm -hmm. on um, the flash runtime. Right. And at at the exact same moment, we were both kind of thinking about what the future of video would be like online. Um, I'd been really interested uh, because of like TiVo had launched and like you could like record television shows and there's this whole concept of like media centers that Microsoft was coming out and you could see the adoption of broadband um, starting to pick up. And when I was introduced to Jeremy, he had a fundamental insight from his time at Macromedia. Mm. Um, and one of the last projects he worked on was getting a flat, getting a video codec into the flash runtime. Um, for, for people, you know, younger than, you know, uh, you know, that are, are too young, you wouldn't realize how hard it is, was to do video um, in the early 2000s. Um, you literally had to hire whole engineering teams, do multi-million dollar contracts with large service providers. Um, you had little, you know, stamp sized, you know, video screens that you could get in or, or download specialized players. Yep. Um, but Flash, which is no longer kind of a relevant media technology, was essentially this ubiquitous runtime across the web. And once a video codec was embedded in Flash, um, Jeremy knew that in 18 to 24 months, 98% of the world's computers would up, go through an upgrade cycle and get a new version of Flash, and therefore there would be this ubiquitous runtime yeah. to deliver a video online. And that was the moment that it made sense for us to go build a new online video distribution platform. And so that's what we set off to do um, with Breakcove. And uh, as a CTO, I was less involved day-to-day -day coding um, yeah. and kind of more focused on product strategy and um, working with our global customers and partners. But I was there for eight years um, leading the company and uh, left a few months after our IPO in 2012. Um, and it, you know, it's still a company with hundreds of employees, a market share leader in the uh, B2B online video space. Um, a good way to think about it is a, almost like a white label version of YouTube. So major media companies and corporations use Brightco's platform so they can build their own direct consumer online video experiences. What was it like to ring the bell? Um, you know, it's funny, like, uh, you see the pictures of um, the New York Stock Exchange with, like, you know, all the hoopla and the antique environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So NASDAQ is a little bit less, uh, you know, <laughs> exciting. Basically mm -hmm. a small room, some green screens, um, and you stand around a little dais uh, and you yell and cheer. But it, yeah. it's a it's a great feeling uh, for the whole company right. uh, as, a, as a milestone. Um, yeah. It's not an end point, um, but certainly as a recognition that you've built something of value in the world, um, yeah. it's a really nice moment to reflect. Yeah, I agree. I agree. A lot of IPOs are looked at by some people, I guess, is just like the exit and the end, but mm -hmm. it's really just a legitimization of the product and the customers and the leadership and the employees has something that the public can now buy. And that's, yeah, not, that's like a new beginning if anything. Um, okay. So that's, uh, now, you know, you IPO, um, mm -hmm. And then you went, I guess, right to, to seed investing or what was that? Yeah. So, um, about a year earlier, um, my second sort of profound uh, career experience was very unexpected. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, a dear friend of mine um, was also friends with the managing director of the Techstars Boston Accelerator Program. Yeah. And I hadn't really heard of Techstars, didn't know what it was. And I, she, I got invited to their um, to a demo day in the city of, of Boston. And at the end of it, I was just completely floored. I didn't really understand who all these people were, all the energy, the vitality, these amazing founders and like what they were trying to build. And it kind of um, just opened my eyes. Um, my personal experience is, you know, being part of the founding of two companies, we had amazing team members, but it was pretty insular now that I think about it. Like I didn't have a set of peer CTOs I'd go talk to. There wasn't like a startup community that we right. belonged to. Right. Um, and so seeing this little glimpse of an alternative universe um, through the lens of Techstars uh, was very, it was very visceral and powerful for me. I have a question. And, yeah, go ahead. You started your first company, um, I guess at that 10 people, or I guess, could you, you were a founder? I guess at that point? Or well, no, I would technically, I was not a founder uh, when I joined ATG out of college. It had already okay. existed for a few years, but basically they, they were, we, we shifted into a new mode of operations. Um, and so basically as part of like the founding product yeah. team, but not necessarily, not a founder in the truest sense, but I was with okay. Bright Cove when we started that company in okay. 2004, 2005. Okay, at that point, this is my question. Was there even a startup word? Was that word even invented? Oh yeah, yeah. There wasn't okay. one when I was graduating college. Like I yeah. didn't, I didn't even know okay. what a startup was or even yeah. understand that at all yeah but very much yeah but you know early 2000s startup was a that will uh, that's what i knew what i was going to go do was go that's, okay yeah, yeah interesting, absolutely interesting. okay yeah yeah wow. so i think i kind of just stumbled into the world of startups um, yeah coming out Quite of college it. um and once again i had a life choice to go take a job at microsoft or go take a job for a ragtag bunch of guys that kind of told me we don't quite know how we'll consistently pay you know salaries but we get to work on cool stuff and yeah. for some, you know, for some sort of optimistic reason, I was like, yeah, let's go do that. So close. You were so close to not. Yeah. You could be at IBM or Microsoft right now, still just in yeah. a cubicle. Well, there's no more cubicle yeah. anymore. And I'm actually really, really thankful um, yeah. for the support I got um, that not everyone gets to take that type of risk. So my wife now, but my girlfriend at the time in college, um, my mom none of them said like why don't you get a real job like you've got college loans you know like all these things is highly risky like why yeah. are you doing this insane thing like no yeah. one ever said anything like that yeah so it seems very natural to kind of go do this thing yeah. and i imagine for many people they don't have the financial um ability to go do that they don't have the family support to do that there may be other obligations that don't give them the privilege to kind of take that risk or to see that that is a risk um, that they can take early on. Um, so I'm always very grateful that um, I had the room to kind of go explore that and it really turned out um, to be transformative. Um, yeah, and then, okay, so let's go into- Yeah, so, so and just go circle back to like how I got yeah. into investing. So yeah. yep. I sort of started as a mentor through this Techstars program, you know, to, to help other founders and really enjoyed that and got deeper and deeply um, immersed into it. And um, at a certain point, I went to, um, you know, the CEO of Bright Cove, Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't my co-founder at the time. He had stepped away and someone else um, came in as the CEO by that stage. And I said, I, I think I'd like to take a three month sabbatical um, and mm -hmm. go work at this Techstars thing and just kind of figure out what this is and how I like it. And he kind of just looked at me dumbfounded, like, what are you talking about? Like, there's so much work to get done here. How can you um, spend any more, t you know, spend time away from the company. And that was the moment I realized, oh, I probably need to go do something new. Like my day to day was busy at Bright Cove, but I wasn't like intellectually engaged at the end of, you know, seven or eight years of the company um, mm -hmm. than I had been, you know, many years uh, earlier. 
And so I, you know, waited around and helped the company get through the IPO. But several months after the IPO, um, I finally transitioned out of the company. Mm -hmm. And I basically volunteered for two years uh, within the Techstars Boston ecosystem, kind of helping to run that program, recruit teams, part of the investment committee process, um, uh, a mentor in residence, working with all the teams on a almost a full-time basis, really just to kind of get my feet wet and to really expand my network and, and to really explore if I enjoyed working with other founders to help them build their businesses. Uh, and that's when I started doing some angel investing and kind of linking capital to advice. And that gave me the confidence um, to go out with the two managing directors of the Techstars Boston program to launch a, a fund together in 2014 um, that was called Project 11 Ventures. Mm -hmm. And um, that was also a really great learning experience, a first sort of professional fund with LPs and, um, you know, leading deals. And that set my learnings up for the next fund, which I now you know co-founded Argon Ventures, which we launched right. in in 2020. Yep. How did you when you started? I guess Project Eleven. How did you figure out how to manage the commercial, the financial, and the mm -hmm. strange world of like um, venture capital financing and um, term sheets and all these interesting things that I'm sure you had help from lawyers, but um, you have to be privy to if you're going to make yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and, and through my experience, both at ATG and Bright Cove, you know, being on sort of the technical product side, like I wasn't really involved deeply yeah. in the fundraising, right? So that there right. was a lot that I, I kind of had to learn. And venture capital is often like an apprentice-like, um, uh, you know, career progression. Like you don't go to undergrad and get a degree in venture capital. Um, I think even like an MBA, like you probably learn the mechanics of it maybe and what yeah. entrepreneurs is like, but you still, you can't get a specialized degree in venture capital. And right. so you really learn from doing and you learn from others. Um, and I would say I had some amazing, or I continue to have some amazing advisors that are general partners at other funds, um, uh, including folks like Rich Damore from Northbridge Capital, who's kind of old, you know, OG, you know, venture capital, um, uh, Michael Scott, who originally was at um, Northbridge as well, and, and then went on uh, to found um, Underscore here in the Boston area. Um, the, the guys at Founder Collective were very supportive and educational um, for me. And so just surrounding yourself with you know, sort of key leaders um, where you can learn from each other and, and learn like from them in terms of the mechanics of deals, I think ultimately is what you need to do. Um, and if you have the opportunity, like building a track record and working with founders, you start seeing all the intricacies of how deals and financings actually come together and start pattern matching against what are good and, and bad design patterns to use as your financing companies. Yeah, I'm assuming, and back to the last point you made, I'm assuming you wouldn't hire we were hiring a um, individual who majored in VC. <laughs> yeah, I don't even—I don't even know what that would. What right. Would mean. Yeah. I, you I, would I, go I, towards the the founder or the, or somebody who's. Well, uh, I mean, I think it's really important <laughs> to recognize that venture capital as an industry is actually a quite wide spectrum. Like, if yeah. you think about the skills and experiences at pre-seed, it's very, very, very different than a growth stage uh, venture capitalist, yeah, right? right? And so, like you could absolutely see someone let's say coming through mckinsey and then you know working at a high tech company then maybe getting their mba at hbs and like and then deciding yeah. to invest at a later stage company yeah. and they're very analytical and they kind of understand how the to drive the letters of the levers of sales and growth mm -hmm. um but at the stage i'm investing they're like there are no kpis no. there are no business metrics to make an evaluation yeah. Uh, you're really trying to ascertain who are these people, right. why are they building this company, what is their insight, and it's much more subjective and qualitative. Yeah. And at least my personal experience is that I, I have a preference and a bias for VCs at that earliest stages that have been on that journey in some capacity. Okay. These, at a minimum, you have the empathy that you can relate to the founders to help them along in their own journey. 
Right. But but obviously there are very successful VCs that have not been founders. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think at the earliest stages, on average, if you've been a founder, at least you know been part of a high growth, you know zero to ten, um, you know startup, mm -hmm. that you will probably have be better and more impact. Um, than if it's just an intellectual exercise about what you've read on TechCrunch and uh, you know maybe read in books or, or seen in movies. Yeah, I, did you did, when, did you ever tap? I heard a lot of Boston names. Have you ever tapped anybody from Silicon Valley? It seems like they kind of started it and would have the most experience. I'm just curious, if, like any advisors or friends that helped you? No, on? I mean, um, ironically, okay. I, my networks haven't really been deep in the Valley. No, I certainly have friends and people I know yeah. that that work there, but. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts. First, yeah. all my jobs have been here in Massachusetts. Um, so I've really kind of leveraged that network. Nice. And then in terms of what you're looking for in founders, um, mm -hmm. this is where things get interesting. You've mentioned a couple of key things that I heard in this conversation, um, having a key insight in an industry, mm -hmm. like break of, and having that grit or determination, or I guess just not stopping even yeah. uh, like you run out of money and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are two, I'm assuming, but what else? I mean, fundamentally, the first question I often ask founders is the question of why. Why out of everything in the world you could be doing, is it this? Why now? Why with this team? Like, I really want to internalize um, that understanding because that, as we've talked about, at the end of the day, building a startup is just really, really hard. It's like painful. It will probably not succeed. So if that's all true, like, why do you want to subject yourself uh, through that process? And if I, can, if I can both discern and come to alignment with their belief system, that's very powerful. Right. So you're looking for them to come into your office, pitch you almost unorganized and say, like, I, I need to do this now because of X, Y, Z, I observe this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not like, so transactional. So, and I think sometimes people think that, you know, if I'm a founder, if I say the right things in the right order, someone will give me money. And right. at, least, at yeah. least in my experience, that's actually not the right way to approach it. Yeah. Fundamentally, you're trying to build a relationship and a trusted relationship. And you're, you're doing that not only because... Um, I want to trust them as a founder, but the founder needs a place to beat trust in me as an investor. Um, because if you have misalignment between a, a company and their investors, uh, mm -hmm. that can create all sorts of headaches uh, and painful experiences as I think well. It was you who told me that it's even more significant than a marriage. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely easier to get a divorce to the marriage than to get a divorce. You get a divorce to investor. They're on the they're on the table. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I guess another way to put it would be like you you are looking for founders who don't want to found a company just to be a founder. You want to look for somebody, yeah. and that's I would say why there's so many failures because that's just the majority. You want to find someone who has identified like a problem in the world that's eating them, and they can do it. They just need capital. Yeah, and and once again, that's just the foundation. Yeah, right. Right. Like, right. right. like you can you can have all of those things. Yeah. But it, the company could still be a bad company to invest in. Right. Yeah. Like maybe you're going after the wrong market. Right. Maybe there are there's too much competitive threats. Maybe you're building the wrong product. Maybe you can't learn fast enough. There's a whole host of reasons why, even if you have the right idea and you have the right belief system and you have the right motivations, that a company can fail. And you can still be the right team in the right market, building the right product and still fail <laughs> because, you know, maybe an existential threat comes out of left field uh, and right. someone releases a new product or there's a new technology or um, there's a COVID worldwide pandemic that you can't anticipate and some black swan event swipes your legs out from underneath you. Yeah, that's so, it happens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How, how do you price a seed round? So it is, you know, pretty subjective to be you know, perfectly honest. Right. Um, there's a balance that investors are looking for to have owner meaningful ownership. 
-hmm. while also preserving ownership for the founders and the employees, right? So there's these heuristics that sometimes you, you hear people talk about where for every financing round you're doing, you're not really selling much more than, let's say, 15, 30, maybe 35 percent at most. Mm -hmm. And so based on how much capital you think you need to raise, you can start triangulating on boundary conditions for what a reasonable valuation uh, would be. Right. So some random numbers off the top of my head, if you're raising um, two million dollars. And, and you at least you had a target of not selling more than 20% of the company, well, then you know your post-money valuation has to be around 10 million posts. Like the, the math sort of guides you um, in that regard. Right. It, it, and, and this is where the other aspect of like the power dynamics uh, come mm-hmm. into play. Yeah. If, if you're a really successful uh, serial founder and you have a lot of options on the table, well, then maybe you can demand uh, a much less or much better terms, right? right? But if you're a first-time founder, you're tackling a really hard problem, uh, you don't have a lot of investors suiting you, well, maybe you're need, gonna need to raise a, you know, a million dollars on a three million post and sell 33% of the company just to get started. Mm-hmm. Right, okay, so it, it varies. Are you opting out of some of these um ai seed rounds if you're getting involved in some because they're just so inflated right now well um i think it's really important to um decompose the ai mar- yeah uh, startup yeah. landscape start, um, yeah. so i like if i was to say broadly speaking i think there's a three big categories you could think about um mm-hmm. ai infrastructure ai tooling and applications that embed ai within their uh core system. So for example, I would classify sort of like AI infrastructure as like, you know, open AI would be a good class example. Clearly, like with ChatGPT, they have applications as well. But like, if you're just using their raw uh, underlying APIs, that's like a new form of infrastructure that you're using to build, um, uh, uh, you know, applications. Um, For tooling and frameworks, there's like, platforms like Langchain, or, you know, maybe there's a new vector database or, you know, other tooling that helps you create agentic processes. And these are tools and frameworks that developers use to try and help them build their applications um, and not just code everything from the ground up. Um, And and those frameworks and tooling um, get more sophisticated over time. Mm -hmm. And then at the application layer, you're really focused on a business problem. Um, yeah. You know, we want to improve the productivities of lawyers um, right. doing analysis of law documents. We want to um, we want to identify deep fakes um, that are being generated by, you know, um, generative AI systems um, to reduce fraud. Like it's a business problem there. If we can build applications um, that kind of solve uh, those business problems. And then clearly you also have tools that aren't really a, solving a pain point, but they create joy and like creativity um, yeah. as well that, that use AI, but there's still kind of like an application uh, focus. Character AI. Yeah. One. yeah, exactly. So I primarily focus my investing at the application layer. And okay. I think about it in the reason two ways. So one is um, the infrastructure layer is just like a different ball game. Like you need hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars uh, to build that scale of plus your seed and they're already built all the good ones are already built and your seed no i don't know if that's true i think there will continue to be really innovative new novel forms of infrastructure in the ai space um okay. you think but i think will have a new open ai for them that'll disrupt them basically. yeah and it, maybe it'll be more verticalized right like so maybe something in the healthcare space will emerge that's really it's special Maybe there'll be a completely different architecture that has nothing to do with large language, yeah. like uh, transformers, that um, uh, creates a new form of infrastructure uh, uh, in place. So I think there will continue to be novel forms of infrastructure, but you are competing with the biggest players in the world. You're competing with Google's, Microsoft's, AWS's. Um, you're competing with companies that can raise billions of dollars of capital. And that's just a really hard position to be in um, as a 
as a startup that's only raising, you know, maybe a few million dollars of capital at the beginning of a, of a seed round. It's not to say it can't be done, but yeah. like, it's just a very different type of environment to, to operate in and, and to build companies against. The, the biggest challenge I see in the tooling sector, and this just comes from my perspective, you know, being a former software engineer and CTO is, the design patterns of how you build applications using AI is changing so frequently mm -hmm. that I find it hard to predict what the next design pattern will be like six months from now, let alone uh, three years from now or five years from now for the life cycle of growing you know, a big company. Right. And so if the design patterns are of how you build AI applications are changing so frequently, then what might seem like a really solid foundation to build on right now could actually be in fad and be irrelevant in a relatively short period of time. And so I think there, there will be clear winners around the tooling space, but I find it to be a completely different risk profile um, for investing and is one of the reasons why we don't systematically kind of look at that category. Yeah. But the reason why I like applications is because fundamentally you're focused on the business problem. Yep. And if you are laser focused on solving that business problem, it kind of doesn't matter how the underlying technology changes. Right. If new infrastructure comes out that helps you solve that problem better, awesome. If the tooling changes on how you should build those applications, that's okay. You can migrate code, you can refactor, you can rebuild different subsystems to adapt, right. but you're still trying to deliver the same value to those customers. And so that's kind of why I like the focus on the application layer. And you're, yeah, and you're invested in some very interesting world changing mm -hmm. companies that if, if blow up, it um, will just radicalize industries. And that's one of the reasons why you're on today. And one, I think your first was tomorrow.ai, um, Climacell is what they're used to be known as, correct? Yeah. So my, if you think about like what my first like AI type investment had been, yeah. it would probably been like a decade ago um, through a, that previous fund, Project Eleven Ventures, and we met these three super interesting founders, uh, Shimon, Ray, and Atai. They were doing their graduate school at Sloan and HBS, uh, mm -hmm. MIT and Harvard, and they had this really intriguing idea that you could predict the weather using really novel forms of alternative data. Um, and you could use machine learning and different sort of predictive models over this alternative data to actually create um, high resolution, hyper local um, uh, weather forecasts. Mm -hmm. And that would be super valuable in the, in the, in the go forward future um, because with climate change, um, you know, the predictability around weather um, was going to be more and more challenging. Yeah. And in certain industries, it's really valuable to understand, is it literally going to rain like over the airport or is it just going to, the thunderstorm going to be two kilometers away, right? right. So trying to have more hyper-local weather forecasting, but be able to do that on a global basis was like a really big, complicated Harry problem uh, to work on. And so we were excited to back um, and lead their very first round. And they originally were called Climacell. They evolved into being a, a company they now call tomorrow.io. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fundamentally what they realized is that they also wanted to focus on the business problem. So like if you're an airport, how do you think about how weather impacts your business? If, right. if, if, if even if you're, let's say you're an asphalt uh, company, like, oh, I've got a contract to go lay five miles of asphalt down on a highway. What is the, how's the weather going to impact that? And literally is that five miles of highway going to have bad weather or is it going to be, you know, good weather? Um, and so the, it's remarkable how much weather really impacts uh, daily business operations. And they've gotten to a stage where they're so voracious for novel forms of data that they've gone and started launching their own satellites, uh, which is super exciting and having new ways of using low earth orbit and radar and other alternative sensing mechanisms to create new data models um, for global high resolution weather predictions. Yeah, nice. And then you were in the first round of funding? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's great. Um, another topic 
of what you're invested in is the topic of deep fakes and uh -huh. um just zooming out of deep fakes even like i just see an issue with a lot of video images text everything being upended by ai because it's all i mean when i was little a picture was a picture but yeah. <laughs> uh, and i'm not even talking about a video i'm talking about a picture it was like that it's proof like if you caught a fish you caught that fish because i see the fish but um that's different now and mm -hmm. you've realized that and so you've invested in uh reality defender which you kind of brought up with mm -hmm. your last example so why don't you talk about them as well yeah and i think it's important to realize in the full, if you think about the full history of photography and imagery like it hasn't always been true like you like you you'd have even in the 18 like eight late hundreds people can manipulate photography yeah. right in a way that could make it be fake right um right. and clearly that got easier moving out of the dark room with tools like photoshop and the like mm -hmm. the the biggest difference to me conceptually at this stage is just the level the scale of automation that can occur right so if the cost of media production essentially starts going to zero right. um, and you can produce any type of media you want at any moment in time and anyone can do it yep the fundamentals of how we perceive reality and how we think critically about what we see and read um just becomes very transformative um, yeah. overall. So anyway, so I've been very intrigued with the challenges around deep fakes. And I think it's rooted off of my experiences from Bright Cove coming from video, mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, my, you know, training as a software engineer, kind of looking at the intersection of those two things um, and emerging. And I was connected with um, the founding team of Reality Defender um, through another founder. And it was the first team that I met that I realized that they were thinking about this as a, as a business problem and dealing with like security issues and not just being an academic exercise. Um, right. and, and that's what excited me most about helping to back them. And so Argonne Ventures, we led their very first financing as they were spinning out of a nonprofit sort of like research group. Okay. And, um, and, and uh, it's been really exciting to kind of see them take off as a company. Um, but of course, that's juxtaposition about the challenges that we have uh, with deepfakes in society and even being yeah. you know, relatively early into that trajectory. But the thing I would, I would have people think about um, is deepfakes are more than just um, issues related to celebrity gossip or um, fake politicians um, our entire world in some ways is starting to be mediated by digital technologies um, to the same extent that if you make a phone call how can you guarantee that the other person on the other line is actually who they say they are right and is, and is not someone using a platform to fake out their voice um, and become uh, someone else. Um, and we were starting to see some major fraud issues with that. Uh, yeah. I forget the exact details, but there was a case study in Hong Kong where I think a CFO was faked out um, and transferred $25 million into an erroneous uh, bank account. I just read an article in The Guardian about an attempted um, uh, scam against the um, CEO of WPP, which is a global uh, media and advertising uh, company. And so I actually think some of the biggest opportunities ahead for a company like Reality Defender mm -hmm. actually has to deal in the security sector of like yeah. fraud and identity and like understanding like, is it actually human on the other line of a telephone call that you're right. speaking to? I don't to? know if you saw Mira Marathi's demo a couple of days ago for yep. 4.0 or 4.0, but um, that the AI now is talking to you in um, it can sing to you, it can it can make its voice dramatic. Mm -hmm. That's only going to get better. I mean, that's that's yeah. really compared to what they have planned. So one can imagine training an AI on data of Satya Nadella. There's tons of hours of his voice probably on YouTube. Mm -hmm. If you train an AI on that and then and then have it talk and call somebody at Microsoft who's a lowly employee, go, I need you right now to buy me a thousand dollars worth of credit cards and then just multiply that by like all the employees or something. 
you're going to get money out of that. Yeah. So and, and clearly, like, you know, they're going to have additional protections for, you know, some like Satya at Microsoft. Okay. Right. But like, imagine if you're an accountant at a, you know, a, a 200 person company uh, in, uh, you know, Toronto, Canada, uh, and you seemingly get all these inputs that appear to be real, but are not. Right. And so, um, yeah. We're going to need multiple layers of defense around this. And mm -hmm. us as uh, members of society are going to have to think critically about what we see, hear, and read um, yeah. as part of that layer of defense. But I think there are going to be novel new platforms like Reality Defender that are, are, are will become important parts of that sort of multi-factor defense uh, approach. Yeah. And I work for a cybersecurity company now and cybersecurity just in general is going to be upended when these AIs are trained to code and, and just all the hackers are going to have to do is tell the AI to go find a find a, a flaw on this website where I can get in X, Y, Z. Um, and that's maybe another avenue for Reality Defender. Mm -hmm. Deep fakes. But um, and then not to just keep um, talking about open AI, but they just the, the, I mean, they're talking to Hollywood as well. They're actually um so much money can be saved with a, a feature length film instead of animating a whole um 10 minute scene of whatever robots doing something transformers or lord of the rings whatever have you you can just have ai do it and it's probably a fraction of the cost so that's that's already happening in even movies yeah i guess you know this always gets to the tension of like okay are these ai technologies going to take jobs or not um right and and clearly in some circumstances they are yeah i think many of us though have the hope or at least trying to craft a world where these ai systems provide superpowers um mm -hmm. to individuals so I, I imagine at this at this moment there are probably hundreds maybe thousands of really creative storytellers mm -hmm. that don't have the resources or the connections exactly. to build a hollywood blockbuster but exactly. yeah who knows five years three years from now five years from now, ten years from now, there's at some point in the future yep they will be able to sit down at a computer or some other <laughs> new device we have maybe they're just conversing with an ai yeah. and create an entirely new world right. that will blow our minds off yep. um, that they would never have been able to tell that story before. And so uh, that's what I am hopeful for, that we right. can strive to kind of create those things. But I think we also have to be pragmatic and, and kind of seeing the downsides of our naive optimism in the past and making sure there's good guardrails and protections and ethics in place um, to make sure that, you know, that the transition and the dissemination of these uh, technologies uh, benefit more people than, than it doesn't. Yeah, um, totally agree. And gaming is a whole nother realm. I mean, it, what the resources that it takes to build a, a AAA game now compared to what it's going to, time-wise even in yeah the, absolutely yeah, yeah it's gonna i mean the characters are gonna be their own thing you don't need to code the characters the environment can be procedurally generated as you play probably so that's gonna get upended as well um it's all i i do think like the design and the creative flow of how humans create things from their mind is just gonna be upended by eggs mm -hmm. It doesn't need to have manual work anymore. But um, let's move into another company. Cognitive Space is another interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about how that AI company is in, uh, do, working with intelligent satellite. Yeah, so, so Cognitive Space um, is in a completely different realm. You know, it's yeah. related to the space industry. And it's really based on sort of um, a few different uh, large trends. So there, the launch capacity to get satellites into outer space is is lowering dramatically, um, you know, the, both the cost of doing so, but also just the number of satellites can get into outer space is, uh, is astronomical. That's gonna continue to improve um, over the coming years. And the ability to build low cost, um, low earth orbits and a variety of different sensor platforms will allow us to better understand the world in new and novel ways. But to get value out of that, all that infrastructure, um, there's some really complicated logistics problems to figure out. Um, so for example, um, 
Uh, cognitive space has worked with the Department of Defense to say, okay, if we want to analyze a certain territory, um, um, because we're doing an exercise or something in that area, we have relationships with, let's say, dozens of different satellite providers. Which satellite provider should we use at any one time to get the right level of data, right? Um, that's a classic optimization problem that um, AI systems uh, can figure out. So based on the weather in that area, where satellites actually are in their orbit path, where downlinks of data can occur, you can create an optimal path to figure out the execution of what data you get at any one moment of time to make sure you get complete coverage for the data that you're looking for um, in that sector. Um, so that's a really sort of, I think, profoundly interesting problem that will that will be a new layer of sort of middleware um, in the terrestrial observation, Earth ob observation uh, space. That same technology can be adapted over time for satellite operators themselves. So if you're managing 100 satellites and you're taking work orders from lots of different companies, well, how do you sequence them in the proper order to actually fulfill and maximize the value of these assets that you have in outer space? And so that's also another sort of AI problem. And I think this general problem of like efficiency gains and optimization is going to be one of the most profound areas um, that AI-centric companies will sort of create material value. Um, yeah. For example, we have another company called Base2 that does this in process engineering. So, for example, if you have a if you're producing um, chemicals or pharma pharmacological um, outputs or mm -hmm. even foodstuffs, um, you know you have pro like engineering processes that you're trying to run, mm -hmm. and you're trying if you want to make those more efficient or you need to change the output characteristics of some way, you can essentially create a start building a digital twin of the factory floor and to model different scenarios of how the processes should change right. without physically changing the plant itself. Uh, okay. You know, shutting down a plant, changing a bioreactor, putting in a new, um, you know, process. And so once again, that's an opportunity where you can sort of create these virtual representations of how the, op the world op works, use physics informed AI or, or other um, systems to try and create um, efficiencies and optimizations uh, within the within the real world and from the virtual space. And civil AI is another one that's um, working more with city infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. So civil AI uses LiDAR scanning and other sensors. Um, they enable civil engineering firms to, once again, to essentially take a digital representation to create a digital twin of streetscapes. Yeah. What's the quality of the road, street cover, right. uh, tree coverage? What, what are stop signs missing, right? And by pulling all of this data from the real world into the digital world, you yep. can start, um, you know, modeling and planning in ways that just were not ever practical before. Yeah, and city planning in general. I was thinking about this before, um, before we even started talking about this, but uh i would sh obviously it's not doable but if you could just erase on the map every city <laughs> so if we took boston and we just made it a blank canvas and instead of what is there now I just told ai to make the perfect optimal city considering roads transportation bikes any input we wanted to give it it would probably create something that a human could never ever ever think of and yeah. then it would get it's built. true but it might also be boring oh like, it you know, be like boring. here in boston we uh yeah. You know, we have a love-hate relationship with our roads, but like we yeah. probably also like the quirkiness. Like, I mean, maybe if we were some of us were in a you know a grid pattern street environment, like we actually wouldn't like it. So I I, I don't want AI yeah. to limit the diversity of choice in the right. world, but I do think there are opportunities to create better efficiency um, and optimization, which hopefully will benefit society over the long term. Do you think as we train models, we'll be able to, we're going to start inputting the human characteristics that we are scared that are going to be lost? Like creative oh, that, that's already occurred. Like if, if yeah. you think about it, okay, so the fundamentals of a large language model mm -hmm. um, in many ways is just reading and parsing text. Yeah. The books we write, the articles that are written, um, those are all a reflection of human culture. Yeah both good and bad, right? And, and, that, yeah. Yeah, and so that's why like there's these challenges around alignment 
and mm -hmm. making sure that like large language models don't exhibit historical biases or, or other issues that we have a society of decided yeah. are, are not um, uh, not worthy to be included. Mm -hmm. But if we if we would take a step back and we think about how many different types of culture there are in the world right now, right? We should probably have AI systems that reflect every aspect of every single culture. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and if we just take it the, the logical next step, if we build transformers and large language models that parse every form of text that we have um, across the globe, then we will probably, I don't think we, that gets normalized into one universal saccharine version of a large language model and one representation of culture. Mm -hmm. What we really wanna have are thousands of AI systems that reflect all sorts of different types of cultures and world be, and, and, and points of view. And so that's actually like, I think that's a really interesting fundamental shift that we should start seeing over the coming years yeah. is we, we think about like open AI, you know, the GPT 4.0 as the single monolithic representation of AI. Why aren't there like a thousand variants of that, that are reflective of some important culture in the Indian subcontent? Right. Uh, you know, why isn't there one that is geared towards I don't know, uh, Hispanic culture in the southeast of uh, the United States, like they should have their own representation of AI as well. Um, yeah. Why aren't there indigenous uh, representations of AI yeah. from the Vancouver Islands? Like all of these have unique characteristics of culture right. that I think should be exhibited um, through our AI systems uh, and that we just haven't got. It's kind of depressing because you're right. This is an amalgamation aggregate of all human experience and well, not all. It's kind of what we're saying, but like, I guess American experience and yeah, no. So if uh, I, 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 I don't know what the training set is for right. open AI, but like right. we can we can assume at least for the sake of argument that it's probably largely a Western world English language. Well, who uses the internet the most? Yes, it's going to be the the top countries, and so we can assume it's going to be heavily skewed to the culture and the familiarity of of humans yeah. in the top countries. But like a, an uncontacted tribe in the Amazon is not going to be a part of this human AI that we're creating. Yeah. and so that's kind of depressing. And I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, and so I just, and so if I was to project that in the future, like would it be real? You know how like in Siri you can choose a voice that you want to speak to you. Like, oh, you want an Irish voice or you want a French voice or, or you know, Southern draw voice, whatever that is. Well, yeah. maybe we should all be able to pick one or more different types of cultural representations of the AI that we want. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that could be really interesting. Now, it may, it may have second order effects that we don't understand. Humans on our own are very complicated to try and interact with a cultural standpoint. Exactly. If, we have these, yeah. if we have these agents that have different cultures uh, that are also interacting on their own world, that could be as equally complicated, but it could also be as equally interesting. Like we like to travel as human beings because we like to experience different cultures. Well, maybe those cultures should be re reflected in our AIs as well. Yeah, I think so, I think so. Um, Okay, out of the company, so, so back to the fact that you see invest, you see invest, and it goes to you're you're basically looking ten years out. You're saying most likely we'll get to a good point um, in ten years. So, what are you looking at now that excites you? That'll be such a big thing in ten years that you're willing to invest, write a check to <laughs> now. This is I, I know this is probably too generic, but once again, it's kind of related to. Um, these business applications. And I would say there are three categories that, I, that I'm that i attracted to, not dogmatic, but so yeah. one is um, uh, how to improve productivity within a corporation, like how to improve the productivity of teams or individuals doing work. Um, you know, that, that, that could be tools that augment a human doing their work, yep. or it could be like these new metaphors that people are creating like the agent. So like, 
Yeah. Like everyone has like five different agents that work for them and go do work and come back and you're yep. kind of coordinating that. So that's, I think those thinking about those impacts on productivity um, yep. within a variety of different industries and corporations, I think it's very, in a very interesting area to invest in. Glue.ai, you just explained Glue.ai. Have you seen that yet? Oh no, I haven't looked at that one yet. It's just announced. Um, okay. Yes. Who founded Yammer? Uh -huh. David Tech founded Yammer and then created his uh, craft ventures. Oh yes, I did see a headline about that. Yes, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly yeah. what you just explained. He's yep. revamping his knowledge yep. of Yammer and doing Glue. But that's yeah, productivity and having an employee for an employee that's an AI almost is. Yep. Like, Lower. And so a couple of Argon portfolio companies fit in that category. There's one called Akuda um, oh, okay. that sort of uh, thinks about how you pull all the data exhaust out of all your um, different uh, business operation systems right. and, and, and augments your intelligence to kind of understand how the business is, uh, is actually operating. Um, so that's a pretty uh, interesting platform. Even yeah. on like the dev tool sides, we have a, plat a company called AppMap. Um, they understand so essentially how the whole system architecture of your um, platform is built and operates. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a peer CTO, like a little angel on your shoulder that can help you um, build better systems. Um, so that also enhances like productivity and, and, and user op and individual optimization um, for the tasks that they want to accomplish. Um, a second area is broadly speaking within the industrial um, and manufacturing space. I sort of yeah. illustrated some of these examples with like base two or cognitive space. Like right. there's just like fundamental efficiency and optimization gains yeah. that we're going to yeah. be able to sort of drive uh, through the market. And then the third category is, I would say, related to the second order effects of generative AI, and they often have to deal with security issues. So for example, um, Reality Defender is a good example of that. We have a company, Peak Metrics, focused on narrative intelligence, a company called BrandGuard that thinks about brand governance. So if you can generate thousands of images um, in your Coca-Cola, how do you know that actually good, they represent your brand well um, yeah. in that uh, different area? So, and I think there will be similar tooling for um, financial services and, and other markets as well. But anyways, those are kind of the three big buckets that I'm excited about. But even yeah. those problems that are starting now, yeah, it feels like sometimes the solutions are tantalizingly close, like, oh, it's just you know, two or three years away. But the right. reality to have a real market impact, it does take about a decade. Um, and so the problems people are just figuring out how to solve now we're not really going to see their true market impact um, for another three, five, ten years down I'll the road. Probably go through a lot of iterations, but stick to the main theme that they yeah. start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oftentimes, about, what about things like replacing people, um, nurse practitioners, or I guess maybe like doctors, individual doctors for people, or tutors? Do you think we'll have a little sidekick that we buy from X company that helps? our sons, daughters. I hope so. Great. Once again, like I, I think, I think yeah. the, I think if we can create these design patterns where AI agents provide individual superpowers, then right. hopefully lots of people just become better like straight away. So for example, let's say you're, um, you graduate from law. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe it takes you 10, 20 years to become a really highly competent, uh, you know, partner, like where you're deep, a deep domain expert in that field. Maybe that can happen. Like maybe you're like a you graduate college and it's like you've been in the industry already five years because you have this AI agent that can help you along, right? If you're uh, a primary care physician and you're trying to ascertain the general health of an individual, yeah, clearly there's it's probably impossible to fit all the knowledge of oh. all the different health uh, yeah, aspects in, in your head. Yeah. Uh, so you can build AI tooling that helps and augments um, uh, your you know, capability or allows you to do triage uh, cases in different way or see insights that we don't see patterns for. Um, so I think th th there are clear pathways for benevolence. Yeah. Well, we just have to be mindful of like, what are the unintended consequences and making sure that we have proper guardrails and regulations um, to make sure that we minimize the downside risks of these uh, capabilities. Have you thought about um, the realm of war and um, defense and how AI, I mean, uh, we're already seeing 
Um, I'm not sure they're autonomous, but we're already seeing drones coming yeah. in. There's, there's companies that are working on autonomous drone swarms that just do what they need to do and get out of there. Yeah. Are you thinking about that? It's or? easy to go go into the doomsday loop, right? right? Like, like okay, um, you know, a small group of a handful of folks will be able to use AI to design a biological weapon that just kills lots of people. Um, that yeah. you can instead of having, you know. Um, dozens of autonomous drones, you could have thousands of autonomous drones that are all weapon systems, uh, right? Um, and they can swarm and, and loop. Like those are pretty profound issues that we're gonna have to deal with. I don't, you know, I think the proverbial genie is out of the bag. Like, I don't know if we can restrict ourselves um, mm. from the access to that technology, unlike what was, able to be done with like nuclear weapons with like non-nuclear proliferation and stuff so what we might need to actually do is build more resiliency right. um, more defense mechanisms so like if the threat of biological warfare increases through terrorism well maybe we actually need to you know counter that with radically more uh, efficient better um, responses for vaccines and drug delivery Right. Um, so like if something gets created and it starts a plague that we can, you know, in near real time, whatever that sort of means, identify what it is, how it affects the human body, create a counter ailment and then distribute it to millions, if not billions of people on a worldwide basis. Right. OK. And now we're going to do a quick AI speed round question. OK. Uh, thing. <laughs> I didn't plan, but I just popped in my head now. So in 50 years, do you think you, I, do you think we'll be going to a general practitioner doctor for our annual checkup or we'll be going to an AI? Uh, I think we will go to a general practitioner um, okay. that will be working with an AI. Interesting. Okay. That's and, and, and part of the reason is um, I don't think the, I don't, I think humans are still going to want to interact with humans. Yep. And I also think the sensors and how we measure human health, like, it's not like we're going to have all those in our house. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, we're, like we're physically still going to need to like go yep. places <laughs> yep. to get access to, rare rare services um uh and and sensing technologies but i would I, it would shock me to my bones <laughs> if that doctor is not a conduit to an artificial intelligence that's helping making um you know key decisions okay next question um i'm rewatching sopranos with my girlfriend um are we same question 50 years but for psychologists Interesting. Uh, I am not an expert in this space. I think there are there is research that shows that sometimes humans have a better experience with therapy when they know they're talking to a computer and like an eight and an AI than a human. Oh, and, and I believe the underlying thesis is that um, people might share more with something that they perceive as being non judgmental. Right. And even though a therapist is not supposed to be judgmental, subconsciously right. you may think that they're being judgmental, right? The this starts getting into the balance of equity and access. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a privilege, and only the rich can afford a human therapist. And for some re for whatever reason, that's still better. I don't know if it will be. Let's say it is better. But on the flip side, who are the billions of people that? could benefit to having access to therapy that they can't right now right because they can't afford to pay an individual to sit down with them for an hour a week yeah yeah but we very much can scale an ai system to help them all so actually i i think most people in the world will will receive therapy through an ai agent in that in that scenario if they can afford a device which is another problem that needs to scale up but yeah. well no but but that's the thing with like it, AI, assuming like inference costs, like, you know, go yeah. down dramatically, like the cost right. of providing a therapist to every personalized therapist to every individual in the entire world, no mm -hmm. matter where they live, 
even if you're like, you know, a Bedouin in the middle of the desert, right. you've got Starlink access to your, you know, AI therapist. Um, yep. You should have as equal right to solid health care and, and, and medical yeah. therapy than anyone else. Right. Um, okay. In 25 years, will children have people coming to the house that are tutors or will they be using AI? Uh, I think the same, it'll be the same thing like the therapist. Augmented, think, okay. I no, see. I guess what I'm saying is I think. Oh, the therapist, okay. People, people with privilege may choose, still choose to hire humans. But there'll be less of them because the market was fragmented from the AI. That's right. But okay. the benefit will be that every child anywhere in the world should have their own personalized tutor. Okay. And, and hopefully that means that human intelligence you know accelerates overall as well or at least we're more well-rounded um you know individuals sure okay and then i guess last one um maybe i'll do 30 years will people be flying planes will that be an empty cockpit oh well people will there be pilots to pilot planes no yeah. i don't think so oh wow okay big one my my uncle is a flight captain so that's interesting i i, I agree though i don't think we need we need captains and, and flights um uh, flight people anymore okay and i guess we can wrap up what's uh what's next for you anything you want to share i guess to, to the public uh no i mean you know i'm outside of Investments. investing yeah. um i love getting really connected to nature so like i'm looking forward to um some bike riding in the summer, uh, sailing on the ocean, hiking next fall. Um, you know, outside of the screen, there is a yeah. wonderful and interesting world. Um, right. And I particularly think it's really important for us to step away from the computers on occasion. <laughs> yeah. Well, my podcast is not helping with that, but I totally, <laughs> I totally agree. And I get out there yeah. a lot. Well, um, my last piece of advice uh, that I often kind of relay to founders is yep. um, by default, we I think there's an uh, implied assumption that you're only working when your hands are on mm. the keyboard or you're staring at a screen. And the reality is most times you solve the biggest problems when you're away from your desk yep. or away or you have the phone down. Yep. And once again, for me, it's like um, the the syncopation of riding my bike uh it's being in the woods with my dog uh yeah. you know it's uh enjoying some art with my wife um in yeah. the back of my mind it's still working it's still processing information you're, work oh, you're working on yourself which is in turn making your day job better almost yeah but it's not even just working on myself what, I, what i'm literally saying is like my brain is processing and synthesizing information and problems that i have at work yeah. But I get out of the oh. daily urgency. Right. Right. And uh and and that's where your brain that can actually synthesize and correlate and connect different concepts yeah. is when you're not focused on the immediacy of having an answer. Right. Because I'm sure you've everybody's experienced this, but when your day's winding down and you're in a dark room in your bed, that's when some of your clearest thoughts happen. Yeah. Now so you so you should actually force yourself to create that time yeah before you go to bed right yeah it's a good so point. like if you if you have the luxury like at the end of the day go for a workout do yoga um go for a walk uh yep. you know with a friend um meditate whatever the thing is that disconnects you from the work or the problem yep. Yep. reassure yourself that you actually are still working and you're yeah. actually probably working at a more deeper, more profound layer. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, well, thank you for right. the fun conversation, Taylor. Thanks for coming on, Bob.